Hello and welcome to Power of Ten, a show about design operating at many levels of Zoom, from thoughtful detail through to transformation in organisations, society and the world. My name is Andy Plain, and I'm a design leadership coach, service design and innovation consultant and uh, educator and writer. If you're a designer who has been told to prove your value or justify your presence or demonstrate impact, uh, it, only to find yourself throwing yourself against the wall of the immutable organizational structure and culture. What do you do? This is what today's guest, Sarah Vakta Sarah Becher, asked and answered in a recent Medium post titled, Hey Designers, They're Gaslighting You, that became, I think, the third most read post across all of Medium that week. Sarah is an author, speaker, coach, and strategist dedicated to changing design and tech for good. She's the founder of Active Voice, a coaching and training company helping organizations build radical, courageous leadership practices. Her most recent book, Technically Wrong, Sexist Apps, Biased Algorithms and Other Threats of Toxic Tech, was named one of the best tech books of the year by Wired. She also wrote Design for Real Life with Eric Mayer and Content Everywhere and has been published in The Washington Post, The Guardian and McSweeney's. And she also co-hosts the podcast Per My Last Email, uh, which we might talk about in a minute. Sarah, welcome to Power of Ten, it's first ever live stream. Hi, Andy. It's great to be here. So it's nice to see you again. Um, tell before we get on to the the gaslighting post, uh, which I guess I, I've seen everyone's been asking you about recently. Um, tell us a little bit about your background because you you know it's not just all about that, right? Yeah. So uh, my background, my background is a little bit. Um, I think for some people, it, they'll ask, you know, like, wow, you've done so many different pivots. And for me, I'm like, hmm, I just keep doing things and they all seem interesting. So I <laughs> started out, um, I started out as a, um, as a journalism student and got a job as a copywriter because, you know, you sometimes are 22 and you need a job. Uh, I certainly did. And, um, did not really love copywriting, but enjoyed sort of aspects of it. And that led me into, the kind of earlier days of content strategy as that discipline was starting to form. I started working at an agency where I was working on a lot of large like website projects. And that just kind of opened up a lot of doors into UX and design and ultimately into thinking a lot about uh, how the design and tech fields have evolved over the past um, couple of decades, I guess, at this point. And so as I went through, you know, my my focus has shifted a little bit from uh, content strategy, content design into broader UX issues, and then really into responsibility and inclusion and more like the ethics of what it is that we're making. Yeah. Um, and after a while, I was working on a lot of um, um, working with product teams and working on a lot of things like workshops for organizations, really looking at like, what is their responsibility and what are the potential harms of the things they're making? And I just kept finding myself really, really wanting to talk to people about their experiences in these workplaces, or maybe the other way around, like people kept talking to me about their experiences in these workplaces and the barriers they were hitting up against as they were trying to um, feel like they could be heard or feel like they could speak up for users. And so that led me into this whole world of, uh, what I think of as sort of leadership and um, sort of communication dynamics and power dynamics in our workplaces. And so that's where I spend all my time now. Yeah. Yeah. And so, the, I mean, the last time we actually did an interview like this, it was about technically wrong. Mm -hmm. um, you've sort of taken a journey that, I, I mean, you and I both coach, and I think we both coach mm -hmm. around a kind of similar area. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of you know, straightforward coaching of how to be, um, you know, that shift of identity from being an individual contributor to being, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, a sort of taste of leadership in management and then it sort of becomes more leadership and, and management. And then yeah. uh, at that point in time, there's often kind of quite a bit of disillusionment uh, seems to kick in. Mm -hmm. um, so this was kind of, well, not kind of, this was really, at, uh, I guess, at the heart of your post uh, about, um, gaslighting. So I know I listened to, uh, as, uh, as per my last email, um, and, uh, you talked about it as well, that, that, you know, gaslighting is a term that sort of crept into 
to a therapy speak, but it's not actually a therapy term, is it? It comes from the film. So maybe we'll start there so that we kind of know what we're talking about before we can move on to it in this specific context. Yeah. And it, I mean, it's a term that is used broadly to mean multiple different things at times. And I also think that that it's not always worthwhile to get obsessed over having one pure definition that is correct. But the way that I think about uh, gaslighting is really, if you look at the film, um, the film, which is from 1944, is a film about a young woman who gets married and she starts discovering that the gas lights in their home keep flickering and keep flickering. And she tries to talk to her husband about what's going on. He is uh, an abusive person and he convinces her that she is imagining things. And not only is she not imagining things, but ultimately in the film, you know, what emerges is that he's the one who is making the gas lights flicker. And there's a whole plot device around this, but the, the term gaslighting is really about this sort of psychological manipulation that convinces somebody to believe that they can't trust their own version of reality and that they have to be reliant on some other party's version of reality. So you tell me over and over again that I'm crazy, the gas lights aren't flickering, and I keep seeing them flicker, and at some point I kind of break and I go, okay, I can't trust myself because I, I keep seeing these flicker and I'm being told they're not flickering. So now I'm reliant on you, right? Now you are the one who gets to decide what reality is and I am kind of at that disposal. And so in organizations, I think of gaslighting as being chronically told that something you're experiencing isn't real. Yeah. And and so in the article, um, you are making the case, so you and I, again, in the sort of coaching practice, I, I've kind of, I hear this quite a lot, you know, and everyone's yeah. obviously trying to do it. And I've heard it myself, obviously, of kind of prove your value and, um, uh, and all the rest of it. And that at some point, well, actually the, the first thing you say, you know, if, if, if that was working, then it would have happened by now. So what's gone wrong there? What do you think is, is yeah. really going on in the design and yeah. maybe it can be a bit more specific because I don't, did you mean sort of design in every kind of corner of, of or is it design in tech? Is it kind of design, so, you know, in-house yeah. design, yeah. in-house I mean, sort of design uh, teams or um, functions? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's an interesting question. So I, I will tell you who I was thinking about when I was writing it, but I okay. will also tell you who was responding to the article. Yeah. And, um, and that's, a, and those are like bigger, that's a bigger circle of people. Yeah. So, when I first wrote it, what I was thinking about were the kinds of people that I was meeting both in my coaching sessions, in the workshops that we host, in the group co pro program that we have, like all of these people that I would meet who were not exclusively, but I would say maybe the largest group were working in some kind of design related function within um, either a quote unquote product company or mm. within like some kind of more traditional corporation. Um, what I have heard in the time since that's been out is that there are a lot of people who have commented things like, oh, this is so true for insert other profession here. Yeah. And so I don't think it is something that is exclusive necessarily to, to designers and exclusive to this one particular context. But I think there's a particular issue happening right now in a lot of design orgs where you have, um, particularly if you have sort of like the, the product function and you have the, maybe like the three-legged stool model of product design engineering, mm -hmm. but where design will almost always be the, you know, smallest, <laughs> spindliest <laughs> leg. leg that's got cool. some beer coasters <laughs> underneath it. Keep... Right. Yeah. It's, it's actually just little, like a pile of, <laughs> uh, of cans and bottles propping something up. Um, yeah. and so this is pretty common, right? So that you, what you'll hear from people is that, um, they're being told that the reason that their discipline doesn't have the headcount of other ones or the reason that they're being tasked with, let's say, stretching to support six different product pillars, eight different pods, nine squads, like really, I've heard all of these stories, that the reason that that's happening is that they haven't proven their value yet. Hmm. And that their job, even though they were hired to be a designer, their job is to prove that design is valuable. And the issue that comes up is that that becomes this never ending cycle 
where it becomes like all about, first off, for the individual, it becomes all about validation, right? Like, have I done enough yet? Have I done enough yet? Which once that becomes your mindset, it actually is, it's really dissatisfying because you lose sight of the work that you care about. You don't really focus so much on, is this the kind of craft that I want to be doing? Or like, how am I learning or growing? It's all like, am I good enough? Am I good enough? Do people like me? So that kind of screws with your head. And it also becomes never ending because there's never like, what is enough? What is enough value? And what happens is that it makes it very easy for organizations to remain underinvested and to just continue to allow you to stretch yourself really thin. And I think that what I have seen is that this problem exists in a lot of places, but anytime you have a function that is um, kind of an underdog in the organization, you tend to see this come up, which means that in a lot of organizations, you will see it particularly badly for like sub disciplines within design. So research, content, uh, maybe service design, if they have it, if they've thought about it at all, where they're sort of the underdog's underdog. And then you see it particularly badly um, because these are people who are really oftentimes brought in because they're very passionate about mm. the area of business that they work in, right? They're, they're passionate about the thing that they do. And so they bring all that enthusiasm and excitement and can easily be uh, bought into the idea that like everything that somebody asks them to do or every potential project on their plate is an opportunity and they can start to feel responsible for the entire organization's content or the entire organization's like level of user understanding. And it's too much. They can't actually do that. It's not really their job. Like the organization, if it really wants to have, for example, good content across everything it does, it should probably have more people to do that. Um, But they get really bought into that. And then that becomes this sort of chronic cycle of seeking validation, feeling invalidated, doing more to seek more validation, still feeling invalidated. And I think organizations really can play into that because, well, if you have somebody who's willing to keep doing that, again, why hire more people? Yeah, I mean, obviously, the the the, the best way to get more, you know, when design thinking was a thing, you know, I, I got asked so many times, you know, how do we get more design thinking in the organizations that were hire oh, some more designers, right? Because no one really says that about we need to get some more accounting thinking in the organization. So we're going <laughs> to retrain a load of our people in, in, in that. I want to ask though that so Peter Mayholtz um asked me to ask a question. I don't know if he's I don't know if he's watching right now. It's great. Probably, it might be early. I'm sure it's um, spicy. Uh, well no, he just said who's the they? Right. Hey hey designers, they're gaslighting you. And he wanted to know who the they was. And he kind mm-hmm. of added to it and said, Well, um, you know, is it design leaders who are doing this as well? And I, I I, I've got a follow on question to this, but I'd be interested to know that bit in the mm-hmm. first place, because you, you did say I sort of had someone in mind when I was thinking of they. Um, well, what I had in mind was the the people that I work with um, yeah. who are experiencing this. Uh, yeah, uh, okay. And I think the they I left purposely ambiguous um, because I do think it's a, it's a few different things that are happening. I think one piece of it is there's an aspect of this that's happening at very high levels in an organization, meaning that um, you you have to think about like what are the incentives of a corporation and when those incentives of a corporation are not actually aligned with uh, doing great human-centered work, that there is a level of gaslighting. Like, no, 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 we definitely care. And then you see every major decision that is being made fundamentally comes down to yeah. like, are shareholders happy this quarter? Yeah, yeah. Which is very different. Um, and I think that that's, that's ultimately, I think, where it starts and where the root of the problem is. But what I also see happening is leaders in organizations, sometimes within design, sometimes like product leadership, um, really uh, reinforcing that kind of high level corporate message about, no, 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 we care, we care, but also, we're just going to continue doing things that make shareholders money this quarter. Um, And then along the way in that process, really telling people that this is how they're going to get ahead. And I mean, and I've seen this happen with design leaders who mean well, um, who want to be giving good advice to their teams, 
but they are so bought into that kind of gaslighting themselves that they don't quite recognize what it's actually doing to people and the impact that it's having on them, which is just a quite staggering amount of burnout and cynicism and disillusionment. I mean, it is quite something what I see um, when I talk to people yeah, about what their experience yeah. has been like, you know, and they're, because because it makes people feel like they're failing personally, like they keep trying to do the thing they're being asked to do and then consistently being told they haven't done it yet. And that that tends to only go a few ways, like either people burn out, they get cynical and resentful. They get very self-blaming and the imposter syndrome takes hold because they blame, internalize all of that. And they're like, well, I guess I am a problem. I guess maybe I just haven't tried hard enough. I mean, it really leads to a lot of negative things and it doesn't actually seem to lead to an actual shift in the way organizations function. I mean, yeah. if, if if it worked, it would have worked by now. People have worked very, very hard and completely fried themselves. And if that's not enough, like, I don't, I don't know what is. Yeah. Yeah. It, it feels that like there's a whole kind of, as you did it towards the end of the article, it's very, very difficult not to ladder this up to, you know, because late stage capitalism, you know, because that mm -hmm. is really kind of fundamentally the thing. And I think, yeah. you know, the reason why, um, it resonates it uh, resonated across a you know a bunch of other disciplines is because kind of a lot of people are experiencing that mm -hmm. in in yeah. many many areas i mean the the sort of mantra of do more with less <clears throat> which is the most kind of horrific thing ever just nails on um, a chalkboard every time i hear it <laughs> yeah and so you know that's been that's just i've heard that so many times and yeah. with a bunch of different excuses like you know it's the global financial crisis and now it's something else and now it's something else right now it's covid mm -hmm. and um so, you know, there is a structural thing there, which is, um, I mean, you talked about values, really. I've always really liked even overstatements, that idea of, you know, it's very easy to kind of pitch um, mm -hmm. something positive, like, you know, employee well-being against a um, terrible employee experience, right? Because, yeah, obviously we want that one, but it's much, much more difficult, you know, and that's what obviously I'm sure you know, even overstatements do that thing of, no, two things that you you want both of, and you and yep. when they compete against each other, you're forced to make a decision. So you know, shareholder value versus employee well being, um, both things we want. But when it comes to it, we'll choose the the former, and that's mm -hmm. the thing that reveals your values. And so I, I yeah. kind of think there's a thing there where um, you know there's that structural aspect uh, which people are kind of slamming themselves up against. Mm -hmm. um, and I, but there's a thing. Was well, a question I want to ask, and you know, particularly in the light of gaslighting, um, I, I'm aware this is going to sound like I'm just doing the same thing and kind of like victim blaming, but I want to explore the idea of how much design as a sort of discipline has been complicit in this. By which I mean, down one end, um, as my ex boss actually Bronwyn van der Merwe was to say the other day, we sort of gave away a bunch of the strategic stuff, having spent like. 20 years or something trying to become more strategic and moving further up the chain and this is you know obviously what you do as a living for a living um we gave a lot of that way partly through to the consultants through you know the whole design thinking thing and i'm 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 partly to blame for that because I've, I've trained some of those people <clears throat> and and also within sort of the organization mm -hmm. then we uh, felt like as a discipline we sort of also allowed um the craft the making of it or the thinking about what we should be making to be taken over um, by product folks and product management. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there was a generation or has been a generation or is of younger designers who are very, very keen to just see their stuff out there in the world. You know, the, the Achilles heel of, say, service design is people don't see their work out there in the world for sort of two years. And I think it was a bunch of people who kind of really wanted to see their stuff out and, and become product designers and, and make stuff that gets out there in the world. Um, and so that allowed themselves to be sort of pushed down onto the assembly line again, uh, where, mm -hmm. and in the worst case, so, uh, you know, the, uh, when I speak to people like Teresa Torres and Melissa Perry and Jeff, Jeff Goh Health and people like that, I, I get, I think they're talking about a very different thing, but in the, in the sort of worst end of it, or mm -hmm. in the middle to worst end of it, you know, the designers have kind of been, been told, I mean, I've had coaches that said, well, my PM has just described how the button should look and what, how thick the outline should be. And they just become kind of figma jockeys. Um, yeah. And there's no joy in, there's no joy in, in that much at all. I mean, it, there is at the beginning of your career, maybe. And 
I, I guess my question is, you know, how, how do we let that happen to us as a discipline? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think, I, I don't know that I have a satisfying answer because I, I think it's something I kind of tussle with. It's like, at what level is that something that design was complicit in or did to itself or participated in? Um, or what level is that more of a response to like the conditions that mm -hmm. were already changing within organizations? At what level was that something thrust upon design? And I think it's, it's some of all of those things. Um, one of the things I did notice was at one point, gosh, I mean, I don't, I don't know exactly when this was maybe, maybe like eight years ago or something like that, maybe 10 years ago, even now, um, as there was a sort of shift toward like, quote unquote, product thinking mm. and quote unquote, product organizations. And I use the quote unquote, because I think that those definitions are, um, are actually much murkier than we often pretend that they are. Yeah. Um, that, um, that one of the things that happened was that there was this shift from like, oh, we don't do all of that, like old school ux -y stuff that's all kind of library science. You know, I was talking about this, um, about like information architecture the other day. Um, that was something that's like, oh, we don't really need that because it's, 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 that, isn't that all about like, I don't know, like metadata nerdy stuff. <laughs> and what we're doing is like, we're making apps, right? So it's like, you think about that shift toward something that was perceived of as like shiny and new and much more as I think you were, you were describing kind of close to the metal, right? Like you would do something yeah. on an interface and then that interface would be live and out in the world on a relatively quick cycle. And there is something nice about that. Um, but I think what you also lost in that process was a lot of deep knowledge or maybe like disconnection from a lot of deep knowledge. I think that that deep knowledge still exists, but you know, if, um, if UX sort of gets uh, flattened into the interface or the yeah. UX slash UI, which I don't really have any desire to ever um, debate about specifically. Um, but you know, if that, if that happens, then there's a lot of, there's a lot of deeper thinking and strategic work that kind of gets alighted there. Yeah. And I think in a lot of organizations just wasn't really happening. And instead, what you ended up with then was product taking the lead on strategy, but product being particularly business led. And that's fine. But there's a gap there that nobody is filling when it comes to that kind of like deep thinking about systems and structure, deep thinking about users, humans, um, and kind of really thinking about how do all those things fit together. Um, but I don't know, did design do that to itself? Was that done to design? Well, uh, my, my question was really how, how complicit were we in it, right? So I, I, I don't, don't know, Andy, know. how complicit were we? <laughs> well, I, I know, I'm, I, I'm being true, that's why I don't have the answer yeah. to it too, apart from sort of yeah. what I originally uh, said. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think maybe we had a moment of um, everyone starting to finally get design because design thinking was a thing that sort of percolated into business. Mm. And, um, you know, in some respects, you know, in, in the end, it was up until recently really good advertising and marketing for for IDO, right? Um, mm -hmm. Because they turned something that seemed had previously been, you know, people staring out the window being creative into, you know, they they made the case for the fact that there's a process here. And I think one of the problems design has had um, is actually we've been pretty rubbish in the sort of public public discourse in talking about how design is actually done. Um, I think we we kind of look at the end result. And partly, I think it's because it's ubiquitous. When I look around my room here, you know, everything has been obviously designed by someone. Um, and I think most people would know, better know how a film is made, for example, mm -hmm. than they know how design is done. Um, and and so sometimes I think the we somehow kind of, or, or people have a better understanding of, say, what the scientific method is than how design is done. And yet it's... Oh, I don't know. Andy, I do live in the United States. Yeah, okay, I don't, all right. no, I don't okay. know that's true. <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, and it astonishes me, I think, and when I think back to that, you know, the film example, mm -hmm. Hollywood did quite a lot of work in, you know, making of movies and directors' commentaries and all of that stuff, mm -hmm. um, which I think actually, you know, was, and, you know, the magic of the special effects of Star Wars and stuff. I think actually that already, that banal as that sounds, kind of really, really helps people understand, oh, there's these things don't just pop into the world. People do mm -hmm. do that kind of thinking about it that you've um, mm -hmm. talked about. 
I think that's one thing, but I, that we haven't really done, and I don't know why we have done a bad job of that. Um, but I, I think there's another aspect maybe that um, we, you know, it's the influence of big tech. It's all the stuff you've written about mm-hmm. also before, yeah. which is this idea that uh, scale and speed are the yeah. dominant things. And not only are they the things that everyone should be aspiring to, but that they never get questioned, right? Those two original mm-hmm. premises, this things should get as big as possible, as fast as possible. That Hockey is so normal days, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and, you know, I think obviously if you're, if you're trying to scale and get as fast, you know, as fast as you can, then there's, you know, thinking about stuff or we might as well just get some stuff out there. And if it's wrong, we'll, we're just going to rebuild it. Yeah, right. yeah. And I think that that, I think that was happening um, as a cultural shift, as an industry shift for, for tech um, at a much larger scale than it was happening specifically within design. But I think that the way design responded to that is also that, or at least there's some some particular subset of design, which I think what we mean when we talk about design is also a, a question that's hard to answer sometimes. But I think when we talk about the people who wanted to do design work within a technology company or within a um, a startup or within an organization that was operating like those companies operate or trying to operate like those companies operate. Yeah. Um, there were a lot of people who found that really attractive, you know, over the past 10 years, really like looking at that as like, oh my gosh, this is an opportunity to kind of go where the action is, to do something that is the more like the big, the exciting, you know, like there was a time when being a designer at an agency was the cool thing to do. And that's what people wanted, right? Go to a cool design agency. And I think that that changed and that interest in being in a product company and that interest in being on a, on a rocket ship, as they say, um, as I would not personally say, (laughs) but people say, um, that I think got a lot of people's attention. And I think there were a lot of people who were really lured in by that idea that they were going to, yeah, like do something that was going to scale really big, really fast. And they would get to be part of it and that they would get to design something that, um, therefore is like so much more powerful. And the result is of course, then accepting that a lot of the design work that they were doing is yeah, like slap together some screens and ship it. And mm. I, I think for a lot of people that has become the de facto design process. And, you know, like you said, they kind of are Figma jockeys where yeah. what they yeah. do is they move stuff around and they get it out the door and they, you know, they don't get to do a lot of exploration exploration or thinking about it um because that's sort of fed down to them and i i think that is i think that is something that is mm, at some level if you don't question any of the other um like basic functioning of a tech company about scale quick scale as fast as possible get as big as possible without questioning any of that I don't know how differently design can operate in those environments. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as part, a little bit of what you're saying kind of sounded, basically everyone got greedy and sold out, right? There's one aspect of we all kind of jumped into that, well, not we all, but design. And I guess well, when we're talking about design, we are kind of talking about digital design in in, in the sort of digital world. I mean, I that's where I tend to focus, yeah. but I think that, I don't think everybody got greedy and no, sold out but, per se, yeah. but I do think that, I mean, look, people... There are a number of people who wanted to join an organization with substantially higher wages than other types of companies and the with the prestige of having a certain kind of name. I think that has also been a big shift in the past um, decade or so where, you know, I think about the kinds of conferences I used to go to 10 years ago, and it was a lot more... I don't know, people doing weird and interesting stuff. And Mm. I look at a lot of the conferences I see now and the things that are promoted the hardest are the companies that the speakers come from. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And oftentimes the talks they give are the most sort of like sanitized, approved by PR talks I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of the craft stuff I feel I um, sort of went by the wayside a bit, or at least I, I mean, the other thing is I kind of feel like mm-hmm. we're, we're having the same conversation, I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm having the same conversations that I've been having sort of 15 years ago. Um, there's, uh, uh, Branding Arts asked a question here in the, in the chat and he said, you know, isn't the behavior mm-hmm. we need to change at the business leadership level? Um, now, uh, I mean, um, yes, 
But I want to sort of slightly uh, uh, kind of connect this question to something else that you talked about in your article yeah. and also something else we talked about before, which is, yes, that's true, but how much can design, um, and that could be design leaders or sort of people further down the, uh, the hierarchy, um, have an influence on that? Yeah, okay. So I think that um, business fundamentally needs to change, period. Um, like if we're talking about the big picture, we're talking about like you know, late stage capitalism. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem to be working well uh, in the sense of like what is happening with our environment, what is happening with our like yeah. standard of living and health, like healthcare in the United States. And right. Like how can people continue to afford to get by who's getting, you know, lost in the margins. Um, there's wealth accumulation at the edges and then a lot of other people not doing particularly well. Yeah. So that's a, yes, that needs to change. Here's where I would push back against that particular question though. I think it's actually really destructive to tell designers that their job is to change the organization, the uh, business leadership. Like it's, it's actually not possible to change anybody but yourself. Um, and that doesn't mean that you can't be influential. It doesn't mean that the, that the things that you say and do might not, you know, might not create shifts in other people. But I think one of the things that happens is that when we decide that what we need to do is like change business leadership, then we start focusing on, okay, well, my job is now to change business leadership and I keep doing things and I keep doing this, doing that, trying this, right? And again and again and again, it's not working. It's not working. And that can start to feel like, well, I guess I'm just not doing a good enough job. I'm not personally effective enough at being influential or at, you know, helping these people understand. And the reality is other people change when they decide they want to change. If they have the information and they don't want to change, they are not going to change. If their incentive structure is still one that is all about our shareholders happy this quarter, which I think is an important part of it too. Yeah, it's no, not just, it is, yeah, are we making yeah. shareholders money, but it's, are we making shareholders immediate money? Yeah. Like if that is not shifting, that's not in your control. And there isn't some magical like deck you're going to present to leadership that's going to make that change. And I think that it's actually really healthy to come back around and say, okay, that is, that is the reality. That is a root problem. I don't have control over that problem. Can I be influential in some ways? Can I communicate some things that are important to me to people who are in more senior roles than me and have more power than me? Okay, great. What are those things? And what is the best work I can do to communicate that? Like, what are the what's the best avenue I have, best availability I have to spread that message? But also, like, how do I let some of that go and say, okay, if this is what is true? How do I want to deal with that reality? Hmm. What are the things I can trade off? What can I accept? What can't I accept? Is this an environment that I actually want to stay in? Um, what are the ways that I am doing my job that are fundamentally like trying to get the corporation to change its incentives? And I could just actually take that pressure off myself and put that energy literally anywhere else because that's that's not going to happen and I'm just going to burn out trying to do it. Yeah. One of the things that comes up for me uh, quite often, or I find myself sort of having conversations about with coaches and they come in and they're, they're sort of in that state. And I mean, there's two things. One is I think designers have made a bit of a mistake. I know I talked about sort of design not being in the public discourse, but the yeah. designers have, and design leaders, I think, often talk too much about design to, to business leaders who kind of don't really care. And I think it's maybe a bit of a rude awakening for people in design leadership to realize that the CEO doesn't just doesn't care um, most of the time about design and process. They obviously care about the, the outcomes of it. And I'm sort of being careful not to say mm -hmm. sort of impact and show your value. Um, and I'm talking about outcomes because, you know, often business leaders, they, you know, they, they want to shareholder, uh, increase shareholder value. And, you know, in VC funded yeah. things, there's always that kind of massive pressure. But that yeah. aside, there's often, you know, a sense of quite, um, you know, worthy and, and uh, purpose and ambition behind a lot of companies. 
Um, and I think, you know, one of the things design leaders have to do um, is understand how you connect to something those people care about and you connect design to it as the way they're going to get it rather. And that's not really a showing your impact thing, but you're saying, you know, you paint this picture of this, this world that those stakeholders yeah. want. Um, and really understand that there's some FOMO building that's going on there that you kind of have to do in order to then say, well, okay, if you want that, well, this is what, this is what needs to be done. Now, obviously yeah. they might go, yeah, well, we want that outcome, but we don't really want to invest in design. And that's probably the time when you go and get another job somewhere. But I think there is kind of an aspect of that. What I see happening a lot though, is the under, you know, yes, we want that and, mm -hmm. and we're not going to invest. And so what happens is the whether it's design leaders or the design team or lots of people in that they end up doing doing the work anyway because they yep. really want to do it well and you know i i look at their calendars and i say show me your calendar as a classic sort of coaching technique and I, i'm like okay mm -hmm. so out, out of this week you have you know six hours actually free and most of that is for 20 minutes between other things when do you get your actual work done and they say well you know weekends and evenings and so by doing that they never give the feedback right they never complete the feedback loop of saying hey you know that thing you want we don't have you the resources have to do it right yeah. uh, because they then secretly do it anyway and then mm -hmm. the the message that leadership get is oh well the one i asked for that thing i i, I got it so why do you need it's more fine. designers right yeah, uh, yeah are you seeing do you, do you hear that quite a lot in your well constantly uh, coaching? i mean yeah. i think that was one of the big things that i noticed was there's there's a couple things in there too i think one when designers are trying to kind of um talk like speak upwards about design and about design's importance they're often leaning way too hard i think on education that came up in the article and that was something i i mm. talked with um with people about as well um where education is kind of a safe approach um where it's like here's our double diamond process or yeah. whatever right and it's like showing people like this is how it should be and these are the steps and this is what design is nobody cares yeah i mean maybe they abstract like maybe they abstractly care if they have all the time free and all the brain space free but they don't and they have their own incentives and that's not that's not actually how you get people to care about design they need to actually like feel what is different when design isn't in the room. And that also means that when design is in the room, having a perspective, having a point of view. And I think that's something that also has been maybe deprioritized yeah. as people have been very focused on creation of screens and just sort of like get into Figma, make some stuff according to whatever specs you were given that the idea of then being able to be like, well, wait, how does design's perspective contribute to the conversation at the senior level goes unanswered. And I think yeah. that's a problem. Um, but I also think that there's, there's this, um, there's this big piece in there that is around people really getting stuck in that place of, I want to, I want to like convince other people that I matter. Yeah. yeah okay. And, and make the world a better place. And that, and that then is, is a great place to overwork because yeah. if you feel like, like people don't, don't value me. So I need to convince people to value me. And my job is to convince you to value me. I'm very likely to then be like, okay, you want me to, you want me to then do like, I'm going to be like the sole content designer to, seven different pods or squads or whichever way that your particular org has decided this is going to go. And you say, yes, because I want you to value content design. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't actually work that way. Um, saying no oftentimes is the way and it's hard and it's scary. And for a lot of people, they're really nervous of what will happen if they say no. But once you start saying no, there's also that difference between, okay, Here's the areas where we actually were able to devote time and look at what we were able to accomplish here. You could have that over here, but you have to choose to invest in it yeah. as opposed to me stretching myself so that I, it hits everywhere. And I think that that's a really healthy way to approach it. That is also a lot more compelling and interesting for the people who have the purse strings than sitting through another presentation about like, the here person. is what user research is. Here are different user research methods. But that education piece, it's, it's, it is very easy for people to get caught up in it because it feels safe. 
You know, it's safe to say here is here is a bunch of methods we could use or here is how our process works as opposed to like, here's a direction I think that we should take on this project. That's much more vulnerable. Yeah, it's it's also sort of the wrong way around, actually, hearing you say it like that. You know, and I've been I've been in both situations because part of what I've done is, you know, mm -hmm. is educate um, both design teams, but also kind of um, cross functional teams in organizations, which is. You know, to say, I'm going to tell you about a process and trust me, it'll have amazing results <laughs> rather than having people go, that's amazing. How did you do that? You know, that, that's a kind of very right. different way around, right? Yeah. 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 And I do think that there's, there's a contingent of folks in design who have gotten frustrated at the call to like learn how to communicate those stories upward, to mm. do the storytelling, to... Uh, be able to have sort of that compelling vision. And I actually think that's an important part of the work. It is. Um, it's great. Yeah. I really do. And I think I differentiate that, though, from proving your value. I think yes. that that's much more about communication as part of everybody's job. Like everybody has to learn to communicate. And particularly if the work that you do has a whole bunch of pieces to it that could be kind of intangible, um, you're going to have to make those things that other people can understand well enough in a way that makes sense to them in a way that feels relevant to them and that's not about giving them a textbook right like if they wanted to understand ux you could give them a ux textbook and that is not actually what they need but that's how a lot of the conversation goes it feels very much like i am walking you through like the 101 class mm -hmm. as opposed mm -hmm. to i understand what your job is and i'm talking with you about the ways in which the work I do is relevant to your job or makes a difference in your job. And I'm bringing a perspective to your problems where I'm like, oh, I actually know stuff that might help you solve your problems that you don't know. And the reason I know that stuff is because I do design work and I have this set of knowledge that you as a business leader don't have. Yeah. And that's something that I think, again, is, is scary for people and they often shy away from. Um, and it does us a disservice. Do you, you said you had some response from other disciplines because I'm always interested because you know I, mm -hmm. I can hear us and I I can hear someone uh, sort of saying, "Wow, well, these designers just kind of whinging again about design, right? Mm -hmm. And design's place in the in the hierarchy and pecking order and all of the rest of it." And you know I kind of get it, and I think you know we we complain about it quite a lot, but mm -hmm. there does you know there definitely does seem a bit of a midlife crisis going on for design at the moment. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this this same thing is true, or have you have you heard that the same thing is true of other disciplines? I mean, I'm, I guess I'm thinking of engineering as the obvious kind of counterpart <laughs> yeah. to design, but um, I'm sure there are other areas too. So I didn't get a lot of uh, comments, at least from people in engineering, saying this is true in engineering. Mm. I think a little bit for maybe some aspects of it, you know, maybe, maybe people who are doing more um, front end work. But the reality is in tech companies now, there are just so many engineers. They don't have the same kind of problems. When you need engineering resources in order to build something that's on the roadmap, engineering resources tend to show up. Mm. And... I mean, I'm sure I'm sure there are people who would say, no, 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 that didn't happen on my team. Yes, I believe you. But I think by and large, there's a very different perspective because there's this idea that, well, we have to ship and we have to have engineers to build the thing to ship. Yeah, we can ship without design or with very little design. We can we can cobble something together from a design system and ship. But if we don't have engineers, we can't do that. And so. I do think that engineers tend to have a different experience. I think that I'm sure there's some overlaps in there. Like I, I do wonder about the way that product management leads on engineering oftentimes as mm -hmm. well. And there's, you know, there's um, schools of project uh, product management that very much come out of engineering versus folks who are much more business focused. And um, I would be curious the experience of engineers who are working with very business focused product leaders who uh, maybe do they feel like they are just being told exactly what to build without really having a lot of insight into um, the strategy or a conversation around trade-offs or things like that? Probably. I don't know enough about that. Um, and I didn't hear a lot about that. I think, I think again, that it's, it tends to be people who are operating in functions that are perceived as lesser or underdogs in their mm. organizations is where yeah. this tends to be really common. 
It, it seems this is what I'm saying, but having the same conversations that we had 15, 20, 30 years ago, um, deeply frustrating that we're still having the conversation that design isn't just about making stuff look pretty. Um, and uh, I still scratch my head a little bit of kind of why we got there. I'm not, I am interested, though, in the, your, the work you're doing with Active Voice. So uh, tell, tell us a little about, uh, bit about that, because you've mm -hmm. also got uh, something coming up on the uh, December the 8th. Is that right? We do. Yeah. So, OK, Active Voice is a tiny little company and we do um, coaching and training programs specifically for people in design and tech. A lot of folks in a, in a range of design roles. Um, and so that's like one on one coaching. We do some group programs and then we run various um, in-house programs with companies. Um, so this event on the 8th of December, this Reclaim Your Power event, this is kind of an offshoot of that article and the way mm -hmm. it blew up. Plus, um, just a bunch of stuff we've been working on internally. We are pulling together what we're calling kind of a year-end retreat. It's like a half day um, of a mix of things. I'm going to do a little bit of a talk, uh, kind of the follow-up to that article about becoming ungaslightable, <laughs> and then, um, and which which I don't think is a hundred percent possible. I think that like we are never we are never going to be a hundred percent resilient to other people's manipulation, but I think there are things we can do that make it a lot harder for us to fall into those cycles. I'm going to talk more about that, mm -hmm. but then we have some guests coming in. So Amy hoop um, is a design systems consultant and she has this talk that is um, about her own experience with burnout and reaching this point of like, nothing even matters. And then what she did to reconnect with a sense of purpose that wasn't all just about being purely career driven all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, Jess Dale, Jess is a, a, a senior design manager at Etsy, and they're going to be talking about their management practice or leadership practice, which they call radical softness. And I remember when <laughs> Jess told me that, that that's the way that they were thinking about um, their practice. I was just like absolutely enamored by this concept of radical softness. And so they're going to be talking about what, is, what does that look like? Like, what does it look like to lead in a radically soft way? And then we're going to have a panel about boundaries and the way in which boundaries can actually happen inside these kinds of companies where people will often say like, oh, but I can't tell my boss no, or like, oh, I want to set boundaries, but it's actually impossible. So we're going to talk about, um, well, how do people actually do it with people who have done it and kind of lived to tell the tale and didn't have it derail their careers entirely? And then my colleague Jen is going to be um, facilitating some activities that are really helping people take all of that and say, okay, now what? What are you actually going to do to make some changes in your life? What do you want to kind of close out of this year in terms of how you're showing up? And what do you want to open the door to next year? so that you can show up in your work in a way that's going to be more sustainable for you, maybe a little more joyful for you, and a whole lot less caught up in those cycles of people pleasing, over identifying, etc. Mm. So it'll be a little coachy end to that. Good. Yeah, that's what we're doing. That sounds good. It sounds very practical. I one of the one of my favorite bits of feedback from a coachee um, who, you know, has been doing very well, well, actually before my coaching, I have to admit, but is also doing even better afterwards, um, was, <laughs> I hope, I like to think. No, but as he said, you know, one of the big things I got out of this was not to take work so seriously. And mm -hmm. um, I know that, yeah. that you know, maybe to a US audience, you know, for whom, uh, you know, their the sort of Calvinist ethic is really uh, strong. But I think it was a really important thing because, yeah. you know, I see people get... I mean, the, as you know, right, the the mental health and well-being effects of, of feeling that stress are really, really real. Uh, and it, it is important, I think, to have, you know, purposeful, meaningful work and people really, you know, that it's important for people at the same time. I think it is also important to go, do you know what? I'm kind of just making rich guys, mostly guys, very rich people, even richer. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I don't think I need to do that on my weekends and at the expense of, you know, time with my friends and family or any of those things. Yes. Yeah. And I, I think that there's this piece in there that's like detaching work and identity at some level, but without just turning work into meaninglessness, yeah. because I think that that's, that's the other end of the spectrum. So what I've seen a lot of people do is go from, okay, fully identified with my career, I'm moving on up, right? And I, and I work with, not exclusively, but I work with a lot of women. And there's oftentimes yeah. a particular thing that shows up there too, which is like, 
I'm going to make it. I kind of like bought into some of that, like, you know, we need more women in leadership. And so it's my job, right. To kind of like move up to and become in. a director, become a VP, lean in. And then, you know, you girl boss your way up for a while. And then you're like, wait a second. Do I, am I happy? Do I like this? What did, and also like, what did it do to me? Like, who did I have to become to get here? All of this stuff starts to come up. And I think it happens for, for everybody. It can happen for people, any gender. Yeah. But oftentimes I think there's a particular extra little spin on it for women. And so then, you know, there's this moment of really kind of rethinking and going like, okay, well, like, do I care about any of this? And what do I actually want to be doing with myself? And what I notice is that for a lot of people, those big identity questions really kick up. And some people respond to that by kind of being like, I can't rethink this work is my identity, mm -hmm. right? Cause I don't know who I am without it. And it's too scary to think about, or people really lose that and then can kind of drift into that cynicism and pointlessness very easily. And I like to think of it as like, okay, we need to think about identity and meaning and maybe some sense of purpose that's bigger than work. It's not just about what's happening in your career. Um, like, who are you without this job? And what do you care about? And what do you, like, what do you want to, I don't know, like, what do you want people to say about you down the line? Or like, what what's going to be important to you, you know, 20 years yeah, from yeah, now? Yeah. But then what are the ways that your work can align with that? And what are the things about your work that you can kind of bring into greater alignment with your values? How do you express your values in your workplace, even if it's not in every aspect, like even if it's just in the relationships you have with your colleagues, um, like how do you kind of make some peace with that, yeah. but make that um, something that can can affirm who you are, but is not the is not the sole driver of who you are. Because I think the other I think ping ponging from like work is everything over to like work is nothing but a paycheck also has not served people no, well. I mean, I've seen them do it and they are depressed. Yeah, no, I agree. I think one of the things that I find the found the most useful on that front is mm -hmm. asking people um, or getting people to reflect upon where they find their energy. And I know it sounds kind of very woo woo, but I, partly it's because I think the body, well, my wife is a psychoanalyst would say the psyche mm -hmm. or the unconscious doesn't lie, right? You, you know, when mm -hmm. you come out of, I was going to say come back home, but you know, for, uh, out these days, often from a day of work, and you feel depleted and you also know when you've got a sort of spring in your step and you feel like, oh, you know, that, that sort of energized me in some way. And I think often just sort of focusing on that will really, really tells you a lot about, okay, the, the, you know, and it's a fairly obvious, sounds really simple, which is I'm going to try and do more of the things that energize me and less of the things that de-energize. But it's more about that idea of a, you know, a sort of bucket of energy and there's always going to be some holes in it that are kind of leaking out but as long as it's mm -hmm. being um topped up uh, a greater pace or uh, you know mm -hmm. the very worst that sort of even the better um rather than these gaping holes where it's just like i'm constantly having to kind of pour so yeah. much in and i'm never yeah. ever gonna kind of uh, get more than the centimeter well, I think at the that, bottom that, that practice of really noticing that has to start with just the ability to observe yourself without judgment which is hard for people mm. and that's i mean there's definitely overlap between that and what somebody might do in therapy but i think it's really helpful in the coaching process which is can you observe what your energy looks like can you observe what your behaviors are can you observe what you're feeling can you just observe those things and just start to notice you know oh like i get really tense in these situations yeah. oh this is really draining for me and the, the first part of that, though, is just letting yourself notice those things, acknowledge them. You don't have to justify them or defend them. You don't have to necessarily like fix them or anything, but just like let that exist and let that then say, OK, once I notice all of these things, what do I want to do with them? Yeah. And yeah. Um, part of that is making peace with reality. And saying like, oh, okay, because part of what you said is like, what's when there's these things, it's like energy just seeping out of the bucket. Yeah, yeah. It can be painful to admit to yourself that that is what is true, that your job is actually depleting you at that level. Like that is a painful thing for a lot of people to have to face. And I, my sense is that a lot of people spend a lot of time almost avoiding looking at that directly because it's painful. 
And my experience is that once you can look at it and work through that pain of like, oh, I've been telling myself that I love my job and actually, wow, yeah. I'm really unhappy yeah. or whatever it is. Like on the other side of that, there's a whole bunch of freedom because now you can be like, okay, I don't have to keep doing it this way. I can make changes. I can figure out where are all the invisible choices and I can start making some choices for myself. Yeah, I, I think, you know, busy work is the avoidance mechanism often for that, right? And to, you can feel, and that's the, the sort of cult of product, productivity is this idea yeah. that, you know, if I'm cranking through, um, mm -hmm. you know, my inbox and, or Slack is kind of, which is supposed to be the solution to email, right? <laughs> kind of made things worse. Well, that's, you're right. You know, I mean, and, the modern and, workplace has an yeah. endless amount of places you could put your energy to avoid facing, like... <laughs> Yeah, but, but it feels like you're doing things. work though, right? Yeah. That's the trick, isn't it? Yeah. Is that, you know, well, and you are, I mean, you are doing work. Kind of it really. is all work, actually. I mean, I think, it, I think it's all work. It's just a way to, it's just work that maybe you don't have to do or work that you spend more time than necessary on. But it's like work that kind of keeps you from the truth. But it's kind of junk food of work, right? That, that stuff <laughs> in, in, the, in the sense mm -hmm. that you can kind of, yeah eat your feel of that kind of work that sort of busy way and crank you know crank through all your slack messages whatever your your you know yeah. The, uh, yeah items you have on in whatever atlassian system that you're using or whatever else right and um and it's not very it's not it's not nutritious right for for the, mm -hmm. the soul and the kind of being and i think one of the things that you know, you mentioned and I talk about with my coaches a lot is, is the first thing to do that self-reflection, to do that, you know, what actually energizes me and what not here. Um, you have mm. to make some space, right? You have to kind of stop the or cut down on the busy work and that mm. kind of sense of trying to kind of keep up with something which is not, it's not possible mm. to keep up with in order to just to have that sort of moment of uh, enough quiet, I think, to, to be able to do the self-reflection. I don't think yeah. it's a thing that you can kind of, that sort of self-reflection is not a thing that you can kind of do on your, your to-do list. I think you can schedule time for it. And I think you probably should actually, if you're one of those people, mm -hmm. but I think it's. Um, no, I mean, it's, you can't put like be present on your to-do list and then yeah. check it off. <laughs> yeah. When you can't sort of cram it, right. You can't go, well, I should be doing an hour's meditation. I reckon can do it in 10, you know, 10 minutes. You know, it's just one yeah. of those things you actually have to make time for. It's funny. It's interesting, actually, you know, um, somebody who's in the, the group program that we run right now, she said something in our session the other day that was just like really stuck with me. She said that she was trying to make more time for herself and taking care of herself and for like workouts and that she kept feeling like she needed to do like a short hit workout because she has so much to do. Yeah. And she decided that because, you know, I can get the whole thing done really quickly with a hit workout. She decided that when she feels that way, actually, what she needs to do is take a one hour walk. Mm, mm. And that was a big shift that like the the less time I feel like I have, the more I need a full hour walk. And yeah. that's something I really wish everybody sort of took to heart. Like the more frantic I feel, probably the more that I actually really need to press pause in a meaningful way. Yeah. So I, if I was to continue the food metaphor, instead of grabbing a snack, you actually sort of take the time to make a, a decent meal and sit down and enjoy it slowly. So yeah. uh, talking of time, uh, we are come, we've come up to time. We're actually uh, almost over time. Um, the podcast, as I think you know, is, is named after the Ray and Charles Eames film, Power of Ten, all about the relative size of things to, uh, in the universe. And so the final question is always, maybe you've answered it, uh, what one small thing is either, either overlooked or could be redesigned that would have an outsized effect on the world? Yeah, I think I think we should go with what we've been talking about. It's the small act of taking a moment to be present in in your reality and to acknowledge what is happening to you and around you. I think that if all of us did that, if we took that second, that minute, that hour, whatever is needed at these different intervals to really just notice what we're feeling, what we're experiencing, the impact that whatever's happening in our day is having on us. I think it would really change the behaviors that we have afterward yeah. um, and also help us really make some different choices for ourselves. Very good. And if people want to avoid doing some work, where can they find you online and, and check you out? Um, yeah, come to activevoicehq.com. 
And there's all the information about our upcoming programs and places you can hang out with us. Um, You can also reach out to me uh, on LinkedIn. I'm there pretty often these days. And I would love to hear from you. So please feel free to hit me up. Thank you so much for being my guest on Power of Ten. Thank you so much, Andy. So I'll put all the links in the show notes. Um, Thank you so much for joining us on the live stream. Thank you if you're listening on the podcast. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you're looking on YouTube, then leave leave a comment. Uh, do you agree, disagree? Got any other thoughts about it? Um, you can find Power of Ten at parlane.com. Uh, you'll find all the show, all the show notes there. You'll find uh, the podcast there. You'll find my blog there. You'll also find uh, links to my very occasional newsletter called Doctor's Notes uh, and um, and everything else your heart will desire. Thank you so much for joining me. <laughs> <laughs>